My name is JL, and I will be your conference operator today. At this time, I would like to welcome everyone to NVIDIA's third quarter earnings call. All lines have been placed on mute to prevent any background noise. After the speaker's remarks, there will be a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during this time, simply press star followed by the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, again, press the star one. Thank you. Simona Joukowsky, you may now begin your conference. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to NVIDIA's conference call for the third quarter of fiscal 2024. With me today from NVIDIA are Jensen Huang, President and Chief Executive Officer, and Colette Kress, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer. I'd like to remind you that our call is being webcast live on NVIDIA's Investor Relations website. The webcast will be available for replay until the conference call to discuss our financial results for the fourth quarter and fiscal 2024. The content of today's call is NVIDIA's property. It can be reproduced or transcribed without our prior written consent. During this call, we may make forward-looking statements based on current expectations. These are subject to a number of significant risks and uncertainties, and our actual results may differ materially. For a discussion of factors that could affect our future financial results in business, please refer to the disclosure in today's earnings release, our most recent forms 10K and 10Q, and the reports that we may file on Form 8K with the Securities and Exchange Commission. All statements are made as of today, November 21, 2023, based on information currently available to us. Except as required by law, we assume no obligation to update any statements. During this call, we will discuss non-GAAP financial measures. You can find a reconciliation of these non-GAAP financial measures to GAAP financial measures in our CFO commentary, which is posted on our website. With that, let me turn the call over to Colette. Thanks, Simona. Q3 was another record quarter. Revenue of $18.1 billion was up 34% sequentially and up more than 200% year-on-year, year, and well above our outlook of $16 billion. Starting with Data Center, the continued ramp of the NVIDIA HDX platform based on our Hopper Tensor Core GPU architecture, along with InfiniBand and end networking, drove record revenue of $14.5 billion, up 41% sequentially and up 279% year-on-year. NVIDIA HDX with InfiniBand together are essentially the reference architecture for AI supercomputers and data center infrastructures. Some of the most exciting generative AI applications are built and run on NVIDIA, including Adobe Firefly, ChatGPT, Microsoft 365 Copilot, CoAssist, now Assist with ServiceNow, and Zoom AI Companion. Our data center compute revenue quadrupled from last year, and networking revenue nearly tripled. Investment in infrastructure for training and inferencing large language models, deep learning recommender systems, and generative AI applications is fueling strong, broad-based demand for NVIDIA accelerated computing. Inferencing is now a major workload for NVIDIA AI computing. Consumer internet companies and enterprises drove exceptional sequential growth in Q3 comprising approximately half of our data center revenue and outpacing total growth. Companies like Meta are in full production with deep learning recommender systems and also investing in generative AI to help advertisers optimize images and text. Most major consumer internet companies are racing to ramp up generative AI deployment. The enterprise wave of AI adoption is now beginning. Enterprise software companies such as Adobe, Databricks, Snowflake, and ServiceNow are adding AI co-pilots and assistants to their platforms. And broader enterprises are developing custom AI for vertical industry applications such as Tesla and autonomous driving. Cloud service providers drove roughly the other half of our data center revenue in the quarter. Demand was strong from all hyperscale CSPs as well as from a broadening set of GPU specialized CSPs globally that are rapidly growing to address the new market opportunities in AI. 
NVIDIA H100 Tensor Core GPU instances are now generally available in virtually every cloud with instances in high demand. We have significantly increased supply every quarter this year to meet strong demand and expect to continue to do so next year. We will also have a broader and faster product launch cadence to meet a growing and diverse set of AI opportunities. Toward the end of the quarter, the U.S. government announced a new set of export control regulations for China and other markets, including Vietnam and certain countries in the Middle East. These regulations require licenses for the export of a number of our products, including our Hopper and Ampere 100 and 800 series, and several others. Our sales to China and other affected destinations derive from products that are now subject to licensing requirements have consistently contributed approximately 20 to 25 percent of data center revenue over the past few quarters. We expect that our sales to these, to these destinations will decline significantly in the fourth quarter, though we believe they'll be more than offset by strong growth in other regions. The U.S. government designed the regulation to allow the U.S. industry to provide data center compute products to markets worldwide, including China. Continuing to compete worldwide, as the regulations encourage, promotes U.S. technology leadership, spurs economic growth, and supports U.S. jobs. For the highest performance levels, the government requires licenses. For lower performance levels, the government requires a streamlined prior notification process. And for products even lower performance levels, the government does not require any notice at all. Following the government's clear guidelines, we are working to expand our data center product portfolio to offer compliant solutions for each regulatory category, including products for which the U.S. government does not wish to have advance notice before each shipment. We are working with some customers in China and the Middle East to pursue, pursue licenses from the U.S. government. It is too early to know whether these will be granted for any significant amount of revenue. Many countries are awakening to the need to invest in sovereign AI infrastructure to support economic growth and industrial innovation. With investments in domestic compute capacity, nations can use their own data to train LLMs and support their local generative AI ecosystems. For example, we are working with India's government and largest tech companies, including Infosys, Reliance, and Tata, to boost their sovereign AI infrastructure. And French private cloud provider Scaleway is building a regional AI cloud based on NVIDIA H100, InfiniBand, and NVIDIA AI enterprise software to fuel advancement across France and Europe. National investment in compute capacity is a new economic imperative, and serving the sovereign AI infrastructure market represents a multi-billion dollar opportunity over the next few years. From a product perspective, the vast majority of revenue in Q3 was driven by the NVIDIA HGX platform based on our Hopper GPU architecture with lower contribution from the prior generation Ampere GPU architecture. The new L40S GPU built for industry standard servers began to ship, supporting training and inference workloads across a variety of customers. This was also the first revenue quarter of our GH200 Grace Hopper Super Chip, which combines our ARM-based Grace CPU with a Hopper GPU. Grace and Grace Hopper are ramping into a new multi-billion dollar product line. Grace Hopper instances are now available at GPU specialized cloud providers and coming soon to Oracle Cloud. 
Grace Hopper is also getting significant traction with supercomputing customers. Initial system shipments to Los Alamos National Lab and the Swiss National Supercomputing Center took place in the third quarter. The UK government announced it will build one of the world's fastest AI supercomputers called eSambard AI with almost 5,500 Grace Hopper superchips. German supercomputing center ULEC also announced that it will build its next generation AI supercomputer with close to 24,000 Grace Hopper superchips and Quantum 2 InfiniBan, making it the world's most powerful AI supercomputer with over 90 exaplots of AI performance. All in, we estimate that the combined AI compute capacity of all the supercomputers built on Grace Hopper across the U.S., Europe, and Japan next year will exceed 200 exaflops with more wins to come. Inference is contributing significantly to our data center demand as AI is now in full production for deep learning, recommenders, chatbots, copilots, and text-to-image image generation. And this is just the beginning. NVIDIA AI offers the best inference performance and versatility, and thus the lower power and cost of ownership. We are also driving a fast cost reduction curve. With the release of NVIDIA Tensor RT LLM, we now achieve more than 2x the inference performance or half the cost of inferencing LLMs on NVIDIA GPUs. We also announced the latest member of the Hopper family, the H200, which will be the first GPU to offer HBM3E, faster, larger memory, to further accelerate generative AI and LLMs. It boosts inference speed up to another 2x compared to H100 GPUs for running LLMs like Llama 2. Combined TensorRT LLM and H200 increased performance or reduced cost by 4x in just one year without customers changing their stock. This is a benefit of CUDA and our architecture compatibility. Compared to the A100, H200 delivers an 18x performance increase for infancy models like GPT-3, allowing customers to move to larger models and with no increase in latency. Amazon Web Services, Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, and Oracle Cloud will be among the first CSPs to offer H200 based instances starting next year. At last week's in Microsoft Ignite, we deepened and expanded our collaboration with Microsoft across the entire stack. We introduced an AI Foundry service for the development and tuning of custom generative AI enterprise applications running on Azure. Customers can bring their domain knowledge and proprietary data, and we help them build their AI models using our AI expertise and software stack in our DGX cloud, all with enterprise-grade security and support. SAP and Amdocs are the first customers of the NVIDIA AI Foundry service on Microsoft Azure. In addition, Microsoft will launch new confidential computing instances based on the H100. The H100 remains the top performing and most versatile platform for AI training and by a wide margin, as shown in the latest MLPerf industry benchmark results. Our training cluster included more than 10,000 H100 GPUs, or 3x more than in June reflecting very efficient scaling. Efficient scaling is a key requirement in generative AI because LLMs are growing by an order of magnitude every year. Microsoft Azure achieves similar results on a nearly identical cluster, demonstrating the efficiency of NVIDIA AI in public cloud deployments. Networking now exceeds a $10 billion annualized revenue run rate. Strong growth was driven by exceptional demand for Infinibon, which grew fivefold year on year. 
InfiniBand is critical to gaining the scale and performance needed for training LLMs. Microsoft made this very point last week, highlighting that Azure uses over 29,000 miles of InfiniBand tabling, enough to circle the globe. We are expanding NVIDIA networking into the Ethernet space. Our new Spectrum X and N Ethernet offering with technologies purpose-built for AI will be available in Q1 next year with support from leading OEMs, including Dell, HPE, and Lenovo. Spectrum X can achieve 1.6x higher networking performance for AI communication compared to traditional Ethernet offerings. Let me also provide an update on our software and services offerings, where we are starting to see excellent adoption. We are on track to exit the year at an annualized revenue run rate of $1 billion for our recurring software, support, and services offerings. We see two primary opportunities for growth over the intermediate term, with our DJX Cloud Service and with our NVIDIA AI Enterprise Software. Each reflects the growth of enterprise AI training and enterprise AI inference, respectively. Our latest DGX Cloud customer announcement was this morning as part of an AI research collaboration with Gentech. The biotechnology pioneer also plans to use our BioNemo LLM framework to help accelerate and optimize their AI drug discovery platform. We now have enterprise AI partnerships with Adobe, Dropbox, Getty, SAP, ServiceNow, Snowflake, and others to come. Okay, moving to gaming. Gaming revenue of $2.86 billion was up 15% sequentially and up more than 80% year-on-year. With strong demand in the important back-to-school shopping season, with NVIDIA RTX ray tracing and AI technologies now available at price points as low as $299. We enter the holidays with the best ever lineup for gamers and creators. Gaming has doubled relative to pre-COVID levels, even against the backdrop of lackluster PC market performance. This reflects the significant value we've brought to the gaming ecosystem with innovations like RTX and DLSS. The number of games and applications supporting these technologies has exploded in that period, driving upgrades and attracting new buyers. The RTX ecosystem continues to grow. There are now over 475 RTX-enabled games and applications. Generative AI is quickly emerging as the new pillar app for high-performance PCs. NVIDIA RTX GPUs define the most performant AI PCs and workstations. We just released TensorRT LLM for Windows, which speeds on-device LLM inference up by 4x. With an installed base of over 100 million, NVIDIA RTX is the natural platform for AI application developers. Finally, our GeForce Now cloud gaming service continues to build momentum. Its library of PC games surpassed 1,700 titles, including the launches of Alan Wake 2, Baldur's Gate 3, Cyberpunk 2077, Phantom Liberty, and Starfield. Moving to ProViz, revenue of $416 million was up 10% sequentially and up 108% year-on-year. NVIDIA RTX is the workstation platform of choice for professional design, engineering, and simulation use cases, and AI is emerging as a powerful demand driver. Early applications include inference for AI imaging in healthcare and edge AI in smart spaces and the public sector. We launched a new line of desktop workstations based on NVIDIA RTX Ada Lovelace generation GPUs and ConnectX SmartNICs, offering up to 2x the AI processing, ray tracing, and graphics performance of the previous generations. These powerful new workstations are optimized for AI workloads, such as fine-tuning AI models, training smaller models, and running inference locally. 
We continue to make progress on Omniverse, our software platform for designing, building, and operating 3D virtual worlds. Mercedes-Benz is using Omniverse-powered digital twins to plan, design, build, and operate its manufacturing and assembly facilities, helping it increase efficiency and reduce defects. Oxon is also incorporating Omniverse into its manufacturing process, including end-to-end simulation for the entire robotics and automation pipeline, saving time and cost. We announced two new Omniverse cloud services for automotive digitalization available on Microsoft Azure, a virtual factory simulation engine and autonomous vehicle simulation engine. Moving to automotive, revenue was $261 million, up 3% sequentially and up 4% year-on-year, primarily driven by continued growth in self-driving platforms based on NVIDIA Drive Orin SOC and the ramp of AI cockpit solutions with global OEM customers. We extended our automotive partnership with Foxconn to include NVIDIA Drive Thor, our next generation automotive SOC. Foxconn has become the ODM for EVs. Our partnership provides Foxconn with a standard AV sensor and computing platform for their customers to easily build a state-of-the-art, safe and secure software-defined car. Now we're going to move to the rest of the P&O. Gap gross margin expanded to 74% and non-gap gross margin to 75%, driven by higher data center sales and lower net inventory reserves, including a one percentage point benefit from a release of previously reserved inventory related to the Ampere GPU architecture products. Sequentially, GAAP operating expenses were up 12%, and non-GAAP operating expenses were up 10%, primarily reflecting increased compensation and benefits. Let me turn to the fourth quarter of fiscal 2024. Total revenue is expected to be $20 billion, plus or minus 2%. We expect strong sequential growth to be driven by data center with continued strong demand for both compute and networking. Gaming will likely decline sequentially as, is now, as it is now more aligned with notebook seasonality. Gap and non-gap gross margins are expected to be 74.5 and 75.5 respectively, plus or minus 50 basis points. Gap and non-gap operating expenses are expected to be approximately $3.17 billion and $2.2 billion, respectively. Gap and non-gap other income and expenses are expected to be an income of approximately $200 million, excluding gains and losses from non-affiliated investments. Gap and non-gap tax rates are expected to be 15%, plus or minus 1%, excluding any discrete items. Further financial information are included in the CFO commentary and other information available on our IR website. In closing, let me highlight some upcoming events for the financial community. We will attend the UBS Global Technology Conference in Scottsdale, Arizona on November 28th, the Wells Fargo QMT Summit in Rancho Palo Verdes, California on November 29th, the Aretta Virtual Text Conference on December 7th, and the J.P. Morgan Healthcare Conference in San Francisco on January 8th. Our earnings call to discuss the results of our fourth quarter and fiscal 2024 is scheduled for Wednesday, February 21st. We will now open the call for questions. Operator, will you please call for questions? At this time, I would like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, please press star and the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for just a moment to compile the Q&A roster. As a reminder, please limit yourself to one question. Your first question comes from the line of Vivek, area of Bank of America. Your line is open. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, just Colette wanted to clarify what China contributions are you expecting in uh, Q4. 
And then, Jensen, the, the main question is uh, for you. Uh, where do you think we are in the adoption curve uh, uh, in terms of your uh, shipments into the generative uh, AI market? Because when I just look at the trajectory of your data center, is growth, uh, you know, it will be close to, you know, nearly 30% of all the spending in data center um, next year. So what metrics are you keeping an eye on to inform you that you can continue uh, to grow? Just where are we in the adoption curve of your uh, products into the generative AI market? Thank you. So first, let me start with your uh, question, Vivek, on uh, export controls and the impact that we are seeing uh, in our Q4 outlook and guidance that we provided. Uh, we had seen uh, historically over the last several quarters that China and some of the other impacted destinations to be about 20 to 25 percent of our data center revenue. We are expecting in our guidance uh, for that to decrease substantially as we move into Q4. The export controls will have a negative effect on our China business, and we do not have good um, visibility into the magnitude of that impact even over the long term. We are, though, working to expand our data center product portfolio to possibly offer new regulation compliant solutions that do not require a license. These products, they may become available in uh, the next coming months. Uh, however, we don't expect the, their contribution uh, to be material or meaningful as a percentage of the revenue. Thank you for Generative AI is the largest ham expansion of software and hardware that we've seen in several decades. The, um, at the core of it, uh, what's really exciting is that, that uh, what was largely a retrieval-based computing approach, almost everything that you do is retrieved off of storage somewhere, has been augmented now, added with a generative method, and it's changed almost everything. Uh, you could see that that um, uh, text to text, text to image, text to video, text to 3D, text to protein, text to chemicals. Uh, these were things that were processed and you know typed in by humans in the past, and these are now generative approaches. The way that we access data is changed. Uh, it used to be uh, based on explicit queries. It is now based on uh, natural language queries, intention queries, semantic queries, and so um, uh, you're, you know, we're excited about the work that we're doing with SAP and Dropbox and many others that that you're going to hear about. Um, and and one of the areas that is really impactful is the software industry, which is about a bill a trillion dollars or so, uh, has been building tools uh, that are manually used over the last couple of decades. And now there's a whole new segment of software called copilots and assistants. Instead of instead of manually used, these tools will have copilots to help you use it. And so instead of licensing software, uh, we'll continue to do that of course, but we will also hire copilots and assistants to, to help us use these uh, use the software. We'll connect all of these copilots and assistants into teams of, of uh, AIs, which is going to be the modern version of software, modern version of uh, enterprise business software. And so, so the transformation of uh, software and the way that software is done is driving the hardware underneath. And you can see that, that it's transforming uh, hardware in two ways. Uh, one is, is something that's uh, largely independent of generative AI. The, there's two trends. Uh, one is related to accelerated computing. General purpose, to, general purpose computing is too wasteful of energy and cost. And now that we have uh, much, much uh, better approaches called accelerated computing, you could save an order of magnitude of energy, you could save an order of magnitude of time, or you could save an order of magnitude of cost um, by using acceleration. And so accelerated computing is transitioning, if you will, general purpose computing into this new approach. And that's been augmented uh, by a new class of data centers. You know, this is the, the traditional uh, data centers that, that you were just talking about, where we represent about a third of, of that. 
Um, but there's a new class of data centers, and new, this new class of data centers is unlike the data centers of the past, uh, where you have uh, a lot of applications running used by a great many uh, people that are uh, different tenants that are using the same infrastructure, and that data center stores a lot of files. These new data centers are very few applications, if not one application, used by basically one tenant. And it processes data, it trains models, and it generates tokens. It generates um, uh, AI. And we call these uh, new data centers AI factories. Uh, we're seeing AI factories being built uh, built out uh, everywhere, uh, all in, in just about every every country. And um, uh, so, if you look at the way where we are in the expansion, uh, the uh, the transition into this new uh, computing approach. The first wave you saw with large language model startups, generative AI startups, and, and um, uh, consumer Internet companies. And we're in, in the process of ramping that. Uh, meanwhile, while that, that's being ramped, uh, you see that we're starting to partner with enterprise software companies who would like to build chatbots and co-pilots uh, and assistants to, to augment the tools that they have on their platforms. Uh, you're seeing GPU-specialized CSPs cropping up all over the world. And they're dedicated to doing really one thing, which is processing AI. Uh, you're seeing sovereign AI infrastructures, people, uh, countries that r now recognize that they have to utilize their own data, keep their own data, keep their own culture, uh, process that data, and develop their own AI. Uh, you see that in, uh, in India. Uh, several, several, um, uh, about a year ago in Sweden, uh, you're seeing in Japan. Uh, last week, uh, a big announcement in France. Um, but the number of sovereign AI clouds that are being built uh, is really quite quite significant. And my guess is that almost every major region will have, um, and surely every major country will have their own AI clouds. And so, so I I think you're seeing just new new developments uh, as the generative AI wave uh, propagates through every industry, um, every company, every region. And um, uh, so we're at we're at the beginning of this of this uh, this inflection this this uh, computing transition. Your next question comes from the line of Aaron Rickers of Wells Fargo. Your line is open. Yeah, uh, thanks for taking the question. I I wanted to ask about kind of the the networking side of the business. You know, given the growth rates that you've now uh, cited, uh, I think it's 155 percent year over year and, and strong growth sequentially. It looks like that business is like almost approaching a two and a half to three billion dollar quarterly level. I'm curious of how you see Ethernet involved, you know, evolving and, and maybe how you would characterize your differentiation of Spectrum X relative to the traditional Ethernet stack as we start to think about that becoming part of the, the networking narrative above and maybe beyond just InfiniBand as we look into next year. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the question. Our networking business is already at a $10 billion plus run rate, and um, uh, it's going to get much larger. And as you mentioned, uh, we added a new uh, networking platform to our networking business recently. Uh, the vast majority of the dedicated large-scale AI factories uh, standardize on InfiniBand. And the reason for that is not only because of its uh, data rate, and not only just the latency, but the way that it moves traffic around the network is really important. The way that you process AI and the um, a multi-tenant hyperscale Ethernet environment, the traffic pattern is just radically different. And uh, with with InfiniBand and with software-defined networks, we could do congestion control, um, adapt, adaptive routing, uh, performance isolation and noise isolation, not to mention, of course, the data rate and the low latency that, that um, and the very low overhead of InfiniBand that's natural part of InfiniBand. And so uh, InfiniBand is, is not so much um, just a network, it's also a computing fabric. Uh, we put a lot of software-defined capabilities into the fabric, including computation. Uh, we, we'll do, do uh, floating point calculations and computation right on the switch and right in the fabric itself. And so that's the reason why that difference in Ethernet versus InfiniBand or InfiniBand versus Ethernet for AI factories is so dramatic. 
And and the difference the difference is is um, uh, profound. And the reason for that is because you you've just invested in a two billion dollar infrastructure for AI factories, um, a 20, 25, 30 percent difference in in uh, overall effectiveness, especially as you scale up, is measured in hundreds of millions of dollars of value. And if you were rent, renting that infrastructure over the course of four or five years, uh, it really, really adds up. And so InfiniBand's value proposition is, is undeniable for AI factories. However, as we move AI into enterprise, this is, this is enterprise computing, what we'd like to, to uh, uh, enable every company to be able to build their own custom AIs. Uh, we're building custom AIs in our company based on our proprietary data, our proprietary um, uh, type of skills. Uh, for example, the, the recently we spoke about uh, one of the models that we're creating. Uh, it's called Ship Nemo. We're, we're building many others. Uh, there'll be there'll be tens, hundreds of custom AI models that we create inside our company. Um, and our company is, uh, uh, you know, for for all of our employee use, uh, doesn't have to be as high performance as the AI factories you, we use to train the models. And so we would like the um, uh, AI to be able to run in an Ethernet environment. And so what we've done is we invented this new platform that extends Ethernet, doesn't replace Ethernet, it's 100% compliant with Ethernet, and it's optimized for east-west traffic, which is, which is uh, where the computing fabric is. Uh, it adds to Ethernet uh, with an end-to-end solution with uh, Bluefield, uh, as well as our spectrum switch uh, that allows us to uh, 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 perform some of the capabilities that we have in, fin- in InfiniBand, not all but some, and uh, we achieve uh, excellent results. Uh, so, and the way we go to market is uh, we go to market with our large enterprise partners uh, who already offer our computing solution. And so HP, Dell, and Lenovo uh, has the NVIDIA AI stack, the NVIDIA AI enterprise software stack, um, and now they integrate with Bluefield as well as bundle, uh, uh, take to market their uh, Spectrum switch, and they'll be able to offer uh, enterprise customers all over the world with their uh, vast sales force and vast network of uh, resellers uh, the, uh, and, in, and a uh, fully integrated, if you will, fully optimized at least, um, uh, end-to-end uh, AI solution. And so, so uh, that's basically it, bringing, bringing uh, AI to Ethernet for the world's enterprise. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Joe Moore of Morgan Stanley. Your line is open. Great. Thank you. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about uh, Grace Hopper and how you see the ability to, to leverage kind of the microprocessor, how you see that as a, as a TAN expander, and what applications do you see using uh, Grace Hopper versus more traditional uh, H100 applications? Yeah, thanks for the question. Grace Hopper uh, is in production in high volume production now. Uh, we're expecting next year, just with all of the design wins that we have uh, in high performance computing and AI, uh, AI infrastructures, uh, we, are, we, are, um, uh, we are on a very, very fast ramp uh, with our first data center CPU uh, to a, a multi-billion dollar product line. Uh, this is going to be a very large product line for us. Uh, the, the capability of Grace Hopper is, is really quite quite spectacular. Um, it has the ability to create um, uh, uh, computing nodes that simultaneously has very fast memory as well as very large memory. Um, uh, in the areas of vector databases or semantic search, what is called RAG, retrieval augmented generation, so that you could, you could have a generative AI model uh, be able to refer to proprietary data or factual data um, uh, before it generates a response. That data is quite large. And um, uh, you could also have applications or generative models where the context length is very high. Uh, you basically stored an entire book uh, into, uh, into its system memory uh, before you ask it questions. And so the context length um, can be quite large. This way, the generative models uh, have the ability to still be able to naturally interact with you uh, on one hand. On the other hand, uh, be able to uh, refer to factual data 
proprietary data or domain-specific data, uh, your data, and, and, um, uh, and be contextually uh, uh, relevant and um, uh, reduce hallucination. And so, so the, the, uh, that particular use case, for example, uh, is really quite fantastic for Grace Hopper. Uh, it also serves the customers that, that really care to have a different CPU than x86. Uh, maybe maybe um, uh, it's uh, uh, European supercomputing centers or European companies who would like to build up their own ARM ecosystem and um, uh, like to build up a full stack, or CSPs that have decided that they would like to pivot to ARM uh, because their own custom CPUs are based on ARM. Uh, there, there are a variety of different reasons that, that drives uh, the success of Grace Hopper, but we're off to a, just an extraordinary start. This is a home run product. Your next question comes from the line of Tim Arcuri of UBS. Your line is open. Hi, thanks. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit about the visibility that you have on revenue. Um, I know there's a few moving parts. I guess on one hand, the purchase commitments went up a lot again. But on the other hand, uh, you know, China bans are, would you know, arguably pull in when you can fill the demand beyond China. So I know we're not even into 2024 yet, and it doesn't sound like, Jensen, you think that next year would be a peak in your you know, data center revenue. But I just wanted to sort of – explicitly ask you that. Do you think that, um, you know, data center can grow uh, even into 2025? Thanks. Absolutely believe that data center can grow uh, through 2025. And uh, there, there are, of course, uh, several reasons for that. Um, we are expanding our supply uh, quite significantly. Uh, we have already one of the, the, uh, the broadest and largest and, and most capable supply chain in the world. Uh, remember, people think that the GPU is a chip, uh, but the HGX H100, the Hopper HGX, has 35,000 parts. It weighs 70 pounds. Eight of the chips are Hopper. The other 35,000 are not. Um, it is. It has uh, even its passive components are incredible. High voltage parts, high frequency parts, high current parts. Um, uh, it is a supercomputer, and therefore the only way to test a supercomputer is with another supercomputer. Even the, the manufacturing of it is, is complicated, the testing of it is complicated, the shipping of it is complicated, and installation is complicated. And so every aspect of, of, um, uh, of, uh, of our uh, uh, HGX um, supply chain is complicated, and the, the remarkable team that we have here uh, has really scaled out that supply chain incredibly. Not to mention, uh, all of our all of our HGXs are connected with NVIDIA networking, and the networking, uh, the transceivers, the NICs, the cables, the switches, uh, the amount of complexity there is just incredible. And and so I'm just uh, uh, first of all, I'm just super proud of the team for scaling out this incredible supply chain. You know, we are absolutely world class. Um, but meanwhile. Uh, we're adding new customers and new products. So we have new supply. We have new customers, as, as I was mentioning earlier. Uh, different regions are, are uh, standing up uh, GPU specialist clouds, uh, sovereign AI clouds uh, coming up from all over the world as people realize that they can't afford to export their country's knowledge, their country's culture um, for somebody else to then resell AI back to them. Uh, they have to, they should, uh, they have the skills, uh, and surely with us, we, they, the, in combination, uh, we can help them do that, uh, build up their national AI. And so the first thing that they have to do is create their AI cloud, national AI cloud. Uh, you're also seeing us uh, uh, now growing into enterprise. The enterprise uh, market has, has two paths. Uh, one path uh, or, or if I could say three paths. The, the first path, of course, is off-the-shelf AI. And um, uh, there, there are, of course, ChatGPT is a uh, uh, fabulous off-the-shelf AI. There will be others. Um, there's also uh, proprietary AI because the software companies like ServiceNow and SAP and uh, there are many, many others uh, can't afford to have their company's intelligence be outsourced to somebody else. And they, they are about building tools, and on top of their tools, they should build custom and proprietary and domain-specific uh, co-pilots and assistants that they can then rent to their customer base. This is They're sitting on a gold mine. Almost every major um, tools company in the world is sitting on a gold mine. 
And they, they recognize that. They have to go build their own custom AIs. Now, we have a we have a new service called an AI Foundry uh, where we leverage NVIDIA's capabilities to be able to serve them in that. And then the next one is um, uh, enterprises building their own custom uh, AIs, their own custom chatbots, their own custom regs. And this uh, this capability is, is uh, uh, spreading uh, all over the world. And the way that we're going to serve that marketplace is with, with, with the entire um, uh, stacks of uh, systems, which includes our compute, our networking, and our switches, running our software stack called NVIDIA AI Enterprise, taking it through our market, um, partners, HP, Dell, and Lenovo, um, uh, so on and so forth. And so, so we're, we're just – we're seeing the waves of, of generative AI um, starting from, from the startups and, and CSPs uh, moving to consumer Internet companies, moving to enterprise software platforms, moving to enterprise companies. And then, and ultimately, one of the areas that that um, uh, you guys have seen us uh, spend a lot of a lot of uh, uh, energy on has to do with industrial generative AI. This is where NVIDIA AI and, and NVIDIA Omniverse comes together, and that that is that is a, a really really exciting work. And so, so I I think the the um, uh, we're at the beginning of a a, a basically across the board industrial transition to generative AI to accelerate computing. This is going to affect every company, every industry, every country. Your next question comes to the line of Toshia Hari of Goldman Sachs. Your line is open. Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to clarify something with Colette real quick, and then I had a question for Jensen as well. Um, Colette, you, you mentioned that you'll be introducing regulation compliant products over the next, you know, couple of months. Yet uh, the the contribution to Q4 revenue should be relatively limited. Is that a timing issue? And and you know, could it be a source of reacceleration and growth for data center in April and beyond? Or is are the price points such that? The, the contribution to revenue going forward should, should be relatively limited. Uh, and then the question for Jensen, um, the AI Foundry service announcement from, from last week, um, I just wanted um, to ask about that and hopefully have you expand on it. Um, how is the monetization model going to work? Is it primarily, you know, services and, and software revenue? Um, you know, how should we think about the long-term opportunity set? And is this going to be exclusive to, to Microsoft, or do you have plans to, to expand to other partners as well? Thank you. Okay, thanks, Tashia, on uh, the question uh, regarding potentially uh, new products that we could uh, provide to our China customers. It's a, it's a significant process uh, to both design and develop uh, uh, these new products. As we uh, discussed, we're going to make sure that we are in full discussions with the U.S. government of our intent in these products as well. Uh, given our state about where we are in the quarter, we're already several weeks into the quarter. That's just going to take some time uh, for us to go through um, and discussing with our customers uh, their needs and desires of these new products that we have. Moving forward, uh, whether that's medium term or long term, it's just hard to say. Uh, both uh, the ideas of what we can uh, produce with the U.S. government and what the interest of our China customers is. So we stay uh, still focused on finding that right uh, balance uh, for our China customers, but it's uh, it's hard to say at this time. Tushia, thanks for the question. There is a glaring opportunity in the world for AI foundry, and it makes so much sense. Um, First, every company has its core intelligence. It makes up our company, our data, our domain expertise. In the case of many companies, we create tools. And most of the software companies in the world are tool platforms. And those tools are used by people today. And in the future, it's going to be used by people augmented with a whole bunch of AIs that we, rent, that we hire. And um, uh, and these these AI platforms just got to go across uh, go across the world, and you'll see. And we've already announced a few: SAP, ServiceNow, Dropbox, um, Getty. Uh, many others are coming. 
And the reason for that is because they have their own proprietary AI. They, they want their own proprietary AI. They can't afford to outsource their intelligence and hand out their data and uh, hand out their flywheel uh, for other other companies to to uh, build the AI for them. And so they come to us. We we have several things that are really essential in a foundry. Just as TSMC is a foundry, uh, you have to have AI technology. And as as you know, uh, we have a, a just an incredible depth of AI capability, AI technology capability. And then second, you have to have the, the uh, best practice, known practice, the skills of processing data uh, through the invention of AI models to create uh, uh, AIs that are, uh, that are guardrailed, fine-tuned, um, so on and so forth, that are safe, uh, so on and so forth. And, and, um, and the third thing is you need factories, and that's what DGX Cloud is. Uh, our AI models are called AI foundations. Our process, if you will, our CAD system for creating AIs are called NEMO, and they run on NVIDIA's factories we call DGX Cloud. Our monetization model is that, that with each one of our partners, they rent a, a, um, a sandbox on DGX Cloud where we work together. They bring their data. They bring their domain expertise. We bring our researchers and, and engineers. We help them build their custom AI. We help them make that custom AI incredible. Then that custom AI becomes theirs, and they deploy it on a runtime that is enterprise-grade, enterprise-optimized, or performance-optimized, runs across everything in NVIDIA. We have a giant installed base in the cloud, on-prem, anywhere, um, and uh, it's uh, secure, securely patched, Constantly, uh, constantly patched and um, uh, optimized and and uh, supported, and we call that Nvidia AI Enterprise. Nvidia AI Enterprise is forty five hundred dollars per GP per year. That's our business model. Our business model is is uh, basically a license. Our customers then, with that basic license, can build their monetization model on top of. In a lot of ways, we're wholesale. They become retail. Uh, they could have they could have a per uh, they could have subscription license base they could uh, per instance or they could they could do per per usage um, there's a lot of different ways that they could take their create their own business model but ours is basically uh, like a software license like an operating system and uh, uh, and so our business model is is help you create your custom models you run those custom models um, uh, on Nvidia AI Enterprise. And it's off to a great, great start. You know, NVIDIA AI Enterprise is going to be a very large business for us. Your next question comes from line is Stacy Rasgan of Bernstein Research. Your line is open. Hi, guys. Uh, thanks for taking my questions. Um, Colette, I wanted to know, um, if it weren't for the China restrictions, would the Q4 guide have been higher, or are you supply constrained in just reshipping stuff that would have gone to China elsewhere? And, and I guess along those lines, if you could give us a feeling for where your lead times are right now in data center, and does the China redirection such as this, is it lowering those lead times because you've got parts that are that are sort of immediately available to ship? Yeah, uh, Stacey, let me, let me see if I can help you um, uh, understand. Yes, the are still uh, situations where we are working on both improving our supply each and every quarter. Uh, we've done a really solid job of ramping every quarter, which is to find our revenue. Uh, but with the absence of uh, China uh, for our outlook for Q4, sure, there could have been uh, some things that we are not supply constrained that we could have sold uh, to China, but we no longer can. So could our guidance have been uh, a little higher uh, in our Q4, yes. Uh, we are still working on improving our su uh, supply and plan on continuing growing all throughout uh, next year as well uh, to work with that. Your next question comes from the line of Matt Ramsey of TD Cowan. Your line is open. Um, thank you very much. Uh, congrats, everybody, on the results. Um, Jensen, I, I had a, a two-part question for you, um, and, and it comes off of, of sort of one premise, and, and the premise is 
I still get a lot of questions from investors um, thinking about um, AI training as being NVIDIA's dominant domain and that somehow as, as inference, even large model inference takes more and more of the TAM that the market will become more competitive, you'll be less differentiated, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I guess the, the two parts of the question are, are, number one, maybe you could spend a little bit of time talking about the evolution of the inference workload as we move to LLMs and how your your company is positioned for that rather than smaller model inference. And second, um, up until a month or two ago, I, I never really got any questions at all about the data processing piece of the AI workload. So the, the pieces of manipulating the data before training, between training and inference, after inference. And, and I think that's a large part of the workload now. Maybe you could talk about how CUDA is enabling acceleration of those pieces of the workload. Thanks. Sure. Um, uh, inference. Uh, inference is complicated. It's actually incredibly complicated. If you, if you, um, uh, uh, we, re- we this quarter announced uh, one one of one of the most most uh, exciting uh, new engines uh, optimizing compilers called TensorRT LLM. Uh, the reception has been incredible. Uh, you, you go to GitHub; it's been downloaded a ton, a whole lot of stars integrated into into uh, stacks and frameworks um, uh, all over the world, uh, almost instantaneously. And and the, the, there there are several reasons for that, obviously. Um, we could create TensorRT LLM because CUDA is programmable. Uh, if, if CUDA and our GPUs were not so programmable, it, it would really be hard for us to improve software stacks at the pace that we do. Uh, TensorRT LLM on the same GPU, uh, without anybody touching anything, improves the, improves the performance by a factor of two. And then uh, on top of that, of course, uh, the pace of our innovation is so high H200 increases it by another factor of two. And so our our inference performance, another way of saying inference cost, just reduced by a factor of four within about a year's time. And so that's really, really hard to keep up with. Now, the reason why everybody uh, likes our inference engine is because our install base. You know, we've been dedicated to our install base for 20 years, 20 plus years. Uh, we have an install base that is not only large, it's in every single cloud, it's in every, you know, available from every enterprise uh, system maker. It's, you know, used by by uh, companies of, of just about every industry. And every, anytime you see an NVIDIA GPU, it runs our stack. It's architecturally compatible. It's something we've been dedicated to for a very long time. We're very disciplined about it. We, we um, uh, make it our... Uh, if you will, architecture compatibility is job one, and that that has conveyed to the world the certainty of our platform stability. Nvidia's platform stability certainty is the reason why everybody builds on us first, and the reason why everybody optimizes on us first. All of the engineering and all the work that you you do, all the invention of technologies that you build on top of Nvidia, accrues to the uh, and benefits everybody. Uh, that uses our GPUs, and, and we have such a large install base, large millions and millions of GPUs in the cloud, 100 million GPUs from people's PCs, um, just about every workstation in the world, and they, they're all architecturally compatible. And so uh, if you are an inference platform and you are deploying an inference application, uh, you are basically an application provider, and, and as a software application provider, you're looking for a large install base. Uh, data processing. Before you could train a model, you have to uh, curate the data. You have to dedupe the data. Maybe you have to um, uh, augment the data with uh, synthetic data. So, you, so um, uh, you know, you have to you have process the data, clean the data, align the data, normalize the data. All of that data is measured not in, you know, not in bytes and megabytes. It's measured in, you know, terabytes and petabytes. And the amount of data processing that you do before data data engineering um, uh, before that you do training is quite significant. Uh, it could it could represent, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent of the amount of work that you, you ultimately do in in um, uh, in what you 
and ultimately creating a data-driven machine learning uh, service. And so data processing is just a massive part. We accelerate Spark. We accelerate Python. Um, uh, one of the one of the coolest things that we just we just did uh, is called CUDF Pandas. Without one line of code, Pandas, which is the single most successful data science framework in the world, uh, Pandas now is accelerated by NVIDIA CUDA, and just just out of the box um, uh, without a line of code, and uh, and so the acceleration is really quite terrific, and and people are just incredibly excited about it. And Pandas was designed for one purpose, one per purpose only, really data processing for data science. And, and so NVIDIA CUDA gives you all of that. Your final question comes from the land of Harlan Sir of J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Good afternoon. Thanks for taking my question. If you look at the history of the tech industry, right, those companies that have been successful has, have always been focused on ecosystems, silicon, hardware, software, strong partnerships, and just as importantly, right, an aggressive cadence of new products, more segmentation over time. Uh, you know, the team recently announced a more aggressive new product cadence in data center from two years to now every year with higher levels of segmentation, training, optimization, inferencing, CPU, GPU, DPU, networking. How do we think about your R&D OpEx growth outlook to support a more aggressive and expanding forward roadmap? But more importantly, what is the team doing to manage and drive execution through all of this complexity? Gosh, you know, boy, that that's just really excellent. You just wrote NVIDIA's business plan. And, and so you described our strategy. Uh, first of all, there is a fundamental reason why we accelerate our execution. And the reason for that is because it fundamentally drives down cost. Um, when the combination of Tensor RT LLM and H200 reduced the cost for our customers for large model inference by a factor of four. And so that includes of course, our speeds and fees, but mostly it's because of our software. Mostly the software benefits because of the, because of the architecture. And so, so we we want to ex, we want to accelerate our roadmap for that reason. The second reason is to expand the reach of generative AI. The world's number of data center configurations. Um, this is kind of the amazing thing. You know, Nvidia is in every cloud, but not one cloud is the same. Uh, Nvidia is working with every single cloud service provider. And not one of their networking um, control plane uh, security posture is the same. Everybody's platform is different. And yet, we're integrated into all of their stacks, all of their data centers, um, and we work incredibly well with all of them. And not to mention, we then take the whole thing and we create AI factories that are standalone. Uh, we take uh, our platform. We, we can put them into supercomputers. Uh, we can put them into enterprise. Bringing AI to enterprise is something, generative AI to enterprise, something nobody's ever done before. And we're right now in the process of going to market with all of that. And so, so the, the complexity um, includes, of course, all of the technologies and segments and the pace. It includes the fact that we, we are architecturally compatible um, across every single one of those. It includes all of the domain-specific libraries that we create. Uh, the reason why you, every, com every computer company without thinking, can integrate NVIDIA into their roadmap and take it to market. And the reason for that is because there's market demand for it. There's market demand in healthcare. There's market demand in manufacturing. There's market demand, of course, in AI, in financial services, in supercomputing, and quantum computing. The list of, um, the list of markets and segments that we have domain-specific libraries um, is incredibly broad. And, and, then, and then finally... Uh, we have an end-to-end -end solution for data centers, uh, InfiniBand network, InfiniBand networking, Ethernet networking, x86, ARM, just about every permutation com combination of, uh, of uh, solutions, technology solutions, and software stacks provided, and that that translates to having the largest number of ecosystem software developers, the largest ecosystem of system makers. Um, the largest and broadest distribution partnership um, network, and uh, ultimately the greatest reach. Uh, and that takes that takes surely that takes a lot of energy. Um, but the 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 thing that really holds it together, and this is this is you know a a, a great decision that we made decades ago, 
which is everything is architecturally compatible. When you when we develop a domain specific language that runs on one GPU, it runs on every GPU. When we optimize Tensor RT for the cloud, we optimized it for enterprise. When we do something that uh, brings in a new uh, feature, uh, a new library, a new feature, uh, or a new developer, they instantly get the benefit of all of our reach. And so that discipline, that architecture compatible discipline that has lasted, you know, more than a couple of decades now is one of the reasons why NVIDIA is uh, still really, really efficient. I mean, we're 28,000 people large and serving just about every single company, every single industry, um, every single market around the world. Thank you. I will now turn the call back over to Jensen Huang for closing remarks. Our strong growth reflects the broad industry platform transition from general purpose to accelerated computing and generative AI. Large language model startups, consume internet companies, and global cloud service providers are the first movers. The next waves are starting to build. Nations and regional CSPs are building AI clouds to serve local demand. Enterprise software companies like Adobe and Dropbox, SAP, and ServiceNow are adding AI co-pilots and assistants to their platforms. And enterprises in the world's largest industries are creating custom AIs to automate and boost productivity. The generative AI era is in full steam and has created the need for a new type of data center, an AI factory, optimized for refining data and training and inference and gener generating AI. AI factory workloads are different and incremental to legacy data center workloads supporting IT tasks. AI factories run co-pilots and AI assistants, which are significant software TAM expansion and are driving significant new investment, expanding the $1 trillion traditional data center infrastructure install base and powering the AI industrial revolution. NVIDIA H100 HGX with InfiniBand and the NVIDIA AI software stack define an AI factory today. As we expand our supply chain to meet the world's demand, we are also building new growth drivers for the next wave of AI. We highlighted three elements to our new growth strategy that are hitting their stride, CPU, networking, and software and services. Grace is NVIDIA's first data center CPU. Grace and Grace Hopper are in full production and ramping into a new multi-billion dollar product line next year. Irrespective of the CPU choice, we can help customers build an AI factory. NVIDIA networking now exceeds a $10 billion annualized revenue run rate. InfiniBand grew five-fold year over year and is positioned for excellent growth ahead as the networking of AI factories. Enterprises are also racing to adopt AI, and Ethernet is the standard networking. This week, we announced an Ethernet for AI platform for enterprises. NVIDIA Spectrum X is an end-to-end -end solution of Bluefield SuperNIC, Spectrum 4 Ethernet switch, and software that boosts Ethernet performance by up to 1.6x for AI workloads. Dell, HPE, and Lenovo have joined us to bring a full generative AI solution of NVIDIA AI computing, networking, and software to the world's enterprises. NVIDIA Software and Services is on track to exit the year at an annualized run rate of $1 billion. Enterprise software platforms like ServiceNow and SAP need to build and operate proprietary AI. Enterprises need to build and deploy custom AI co-pilots. We have the AI technology, expertise, and scale to help customers build custom models with their proprietary data on NVIDIA DGX Cloud and deploy the AI applications on enterprise-grade NVIDIA AI Enterprise. NVIDIA is essentially an AI foundry. NVIDIA's GPUs, CPUs, networking, AI foundry services, and NVIDIA AI Enterprise software 
are all growth engines in full throttle. Thanks for joining us today. We look forward to updating you on our progress next quarter. This concludes today's conference call.